Okay, good morning. Please be seated. Good morning, venerables, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming to the English panel on humanistic Buddhism, holding true to the original intent of Buddha. Okay, I would just like to say I'm actually quite excited because this is the first time in Guangxi history that we actually have an official English community to sit down to talk about the definition, the perspective, and the future of humanistic Buddhism. So this is indeed a very important moment. And so for this morning's panel and this important moment, um, this morning, Venerable Hui Fong and I will be co-hosting the panel. And the selection of the panel, as you can see on stage, has been determined by their recent activities in terms of their propagation works on humanistic Buddhism. Either they've been writing papers or actually teaching classes with the actual word humanistic Buddhism. And so nevertheless, I think this morning it will be a moment for us to come together to really open up this book and to think about this very important text which has been written by Venerable Master Xing Yun in a period of three months. And why had he spent so much time in writing this? So just, I would just like to say, um, it actually all began last year when we held this symposium on humanistic Buddhism. And he wanted to provide answers to scholars who have been asking questions such as, what is humanistic Buddhism? Why? Okay. So how do you explain and propagate humanistic Buddhism? So on that day, he came up with four pieces of paper titled My Understanding of Humanistic Buddhism, which is chapter one of the book, that provided quite a lot of insights which had scholars leaving with smiles and satisfied hearts. Okay. And so as we continue to discuss the, reflex, uh, the reflections of these articles, we came to realize that it's even more important for us to fully state the importance and the contents of humanistic Buddhism. So he could, he kept writing, he kept writing day and night, non-stop, um, repeating every article five times a day, so that you know these articles would be ready for the new humanistic Buddhism journal. And so as a result, he decided that we should have a book, and so that's what we have. And so before I introduce the panel, I'll just do a quick opening, and as we go in, go to each panelist, we'll have a chance to introduce them. And so next slide, please. And so for those. Uh, do you guys all have a book in your hand? Yes. Okay, so let's please open to the table of contents and take a look at what has been presented, what has been given to us as Humanistic Buddhism 101, or we could say the Bible of Humanistic Buddhism from this moment on. Okay. And so basically it's divided into nine parts, okay, beginning with the forward, then the preface, which is my understanding of Humanistic Buddhism, and then chapter one to six will cover overview, Humanistic Lifestyle of the Buddha, Core Concepts of Humanistic Buddhism, Development of Buddhism in China, and then Contemporary Development of Chinese Buddhism, followed by Conclusion. So it's a pretty good layout of understanding, history, as well as perspective and perspective. Next slide, please. And so the messages behind these chapters um, are listed as follows. First of all, you will see this is Venerable Master Xing Yun's perspective, how he sees humanistic Buddhism. So in this chapter, he wants to talk about why we are preaching or teaching or propagating humanistic Buddhism. In other words, it's not just Buddhism. He wants to set the record straight. Okay, this is what it's about. From now on, we will be speaking about humanistic Buddhism. And then secondly, there will be his understandings. You know, why it's important, whether it's secular or profane, whether it's you know important, and so on. Then followed by the direct relations with the Buddha, how the core concepts lay out. And also, he wants us to see where we are coming from in terms of the history of Chinese Buddhism, and what we are going through right now, the ING, right, the present tense, 现在进行时, the contemporary development of humanistic Buddhism. And then followed by a conclusion that gives us perspective. This is how we speak of humanistic Buddhism. This is how we can propagate it. And this is how we need to think about the future perspectives, the foreseeable future of the order of humanistic Buddhism as a whole. 
And so I would say, when I read the book, I really enjoyed it because it's really easy to read. And I went through it pretty quickly and I got a good understanding of his 90 years of propagation and belief. And so that will start us off somewhere. And so, next slide please. And so, I'm going to go to the forward now before I go on to Venerable Hui Fong and the rest of the panelists. Okay, so as said in the forward, Venerable Master wants to set the record straight. Okay, why humanistic Buddhism instead of just Buddhism? Okay? We have these questions. You know, some of us believe that we could just speak about Buddhism as humanistic Buddhism. But really, if our Venerable Master is saying, no, let's talk about humanistic Buddhism as humanistic Buddhism, then for the English community, we will now have to deal with that issue. What does 人间 imply? Okay. How do we define it? And how do we find the bridge between 人间 and the English or the Western mindset to make sure that we are talking about the same thing? We are speaking on the same page. Okay. So in terms of 人间, you will see that our community as well as scholars around the world have given it quite a few definitions. You've got humanistic Buddhism, engaged Buddhism, socially engaged Buddhism or Buddhist social movement. You know, that's how some scholars see us, you know, sociologists, sociologists and anthropologists. And then you've got this worldly Buddhism, And then my recent finding is people say, why don't you just call it 人间 Buddhism? So you have so many of these tr translations. So which one do we follow? I'm sure this question has crossed your mind many a times. Okay, so this is something which we, as we come together, we can also think about and discuss. Okay. But having thought about all of this, um, I guess I've come to the final conclusion that, you know, as a young member of the community, okay, I, there is a need to respect tradition. When I came to Foguangshan, the word humanistic Buddhism was already there. So I decided that before I reject it, I need to understand it first. I need to understand its meaning and see where it's coming from. Okay. So I would even ask our brothers from Silai Temple, you know, who actually came up with humanistic Buddhism. That would be nice to kind of understand and know. Okay. And so in the process of understanding, I actually um, try to um, provide a link between humanistic Buddhism and Western humanism, which pretty much has been deemed as atheism. The rejection of religion, the rejection of God, so as a result, when you go to Western scholars and say, oh, I am a propagator of humanistic Buddhism, and you go, oh, so are you rejecting God? Are you rejecting religion? And so we are pretty much in a trap right now. Okay? We can't get out of this trap. But as we are all on the same boat, how do we struggle and how do we actually find a direction out of this trap? So this is something which we can also do. So I'm just going to quickly use four slides to um, present my attempt. Okay, that's just my attempt. So, first of all, by referring to the dictionary definition, you will see that when we talk about humanistic, it's actually an adjective for humanism. 人本主义, 人文主义. Okay? And so what does humanism mean? Um, in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, you will see it pretty much says it's a doctrine, an attitude, or a way of life centered on human interests or values. Okay? And but it adds, is a philosophy that usually rejects supernaturalism and stresses an individual dignity, worth, and capacity for self-realization through reason. What does that sound like? It sounds like Renjian Fo Jiao, doesn't it? So that's exactly what we are. Okay, so how do we rationalize ourselves through the word humanistic Buddhism and then create that bridge between East and West? Okay, so I would say with that dictionary definition, it's pretty much giving me quite a lot of confidence. So you've got the adjective humanistic or humanistically adverb. Okay, next, next slide. And so in the West, they talk about humanistic Buddhism, uh, the humanism idea a lot, okay, especially in the American Humanist Association. Okay, across the years, they have come up with declarations. So in the founding of an association on an idea, we usually come up with a creed or a definition or like a system of belief to set the guideline of our future directions. So I'm just using this example. This humanist manifesto has been set up ever since 1933. So in the beginning, it's been introduced as a new religion. 
Okay, a religious movement to transcend and replace previous religions based on some kind of supernatural revelation. Okay, again, the rejection of something supernatural or religion or God or divinity. And but in 1973, 40 years later, they refined and re revised this humanistic manifesto and believe that what's more, even more important now is to realize that by believing in humanism, it means no deity will save us. We have to depend on ourselves. Okay? And we are responsible for what we are and for what we will be. What does that sound like? Right? Humanistic Buddhism. Yeah. So this is quite encouraging. Right? So, yeah, rely on the self, rely on the Dharma, rely on nothing else. Right? It's exactly the same thing. They're just speaking in different words in a different language. And thirdly, in 2003, closer, okay, they revised it again and realized that humanistic, humanism is a set of ideas that covers knowledge that is found through proof of evidence. And ethics, that humans, as human beings are social, you need to be a part of the community and we need to be there to be of service to humane ideas. What does that sound like? Okay. So I would say this pretty much helps us rationalize the definition or the meaning of humanism or humanistic itself. Would you agree? Yes. So we are set up a pretty good start. So I say we are on the right track by speaking about humanistic Buddhism. Next slide. And so this is from a priest. So his conclusion from the Humanist Manifesto is that we have to act for ourselves, not God. Okay, that's one thing. We have powers of a remarkable kind. What's that? To make things happen ourselves. And we have a high degree of freedom and responsibility for the kind of world which we live and rests within us. So what does that sound like? Humanistic Buddhism, Renjian Fo Jiao. And so through this, we are starting to establish rational and probable links between the idea of humanism, especially through the perspective of religious humanism. Next slide. And so in conclusion, I would say, as we speak of humanistic Buddhism, it's a doctrine or an attitude or a way of life centered on human interest or value. Ren Yao De, right? What is needed by human beings? It refers to evidence of rational thinking over established doctrine of faith. Okay, we have to put it into action. So humanistic Buddhism, as a religious humanism, it's actually faith in action. And thirdly, through calling itself religion, it substitutes faith in men for God. So what does that sound like? Right? I believe in myself, I rely on myself. And so finding all these definitions, and when I kind of place it next to Venerable Master's thoughts, they actually coincide almost in perfection. But Venerable Master's idea becomes even more transcendental in our faith of the self through the form of humanistic Buddhism. Okay, next slide, almost there, hang in there. And so this is what Venerable Master says as he opened up his very first book. Now actually it's like the third one, The Biography of Sakyamuni Buddha. Okay? This is what he says. This is what he said at age 26. This is what he's still saying. Okay? So he was born in this world, Sakyamuni Buddha, cultivated, attained enlightenment, and shared the deeds in this world. And so the human world was emphasized in everything he did. The Buddha's life as a human being can serve as an inspiration and as a model for spiritual practice of our own lives. So as a young Buddhist monk, when he set out to really teach and propagate humanistic Buddhism, he already knew where he was going. And so, next slide. So in my attempt to try to defend or define humanistic Buddhism, to begin with the findings, it all falls down into this. The basic doctrines of humanistic Buddhism as dependent origination, shunyata, or anatman. Okay? And the essence will be something that brings us joy, something that is altruistic, something that is relevant. Okay? And so to define all of this, it's what the Buddha taught, what human beings need, that which purifies and is virtuous and beautiful. So in opening of today's panel, you know, I would like to present a simple way to define and to defend humanistic Buddhism as an English language to coincide with Venerable Master's forward. 
There is simply no other way. Our one direction will be humanistic Buddhism. Therefore, we are here with this book. And so hopefully, when we set out with a similar mindset, now we're going to spend the rest of the panel to go through each of this book through the assistance of our panelists. Okay, so now I'm going to hand the mic over to Venerable Hui Feng for his opening remark as our co-host. <laughs>